I'm Linda Dashu. Previous videos have focused on design and performance. Now we'd like to show you the history that led to the FPBs. Steve had a fiberglass display business when we first met in 1965. Being a mountain girl from Idaho, I had no sailing experience. But after a couple of training regattas, we won the Shark Catamaran National Championship the following summer. A series of C and D class cats followed. The fiberglass end of the business led us into the construction industry, where Steve pioneered the concept of giant flying forms for which a dozen patents were issued. The arrival of our daughter Elise in 1969 triggered the start of a quest for the ideal cruising yacht. Beowulf 5 was Steve's concept of a family cruiser. That's me on the forward trapeze wire. She won five World Multihull Championships and set the world sailing speed record at 31.6 knots. Fifty years later and Beowulf is still winning races. Now joined by Elise with her own election races. Sarah's arrival in 1972 precipitated Beowulf 6, a 38-foot cat that could average twice wind speed and had a luxurious interior. The sale of our construction business with Steve signing a five-year non-compete provided the opportunity for a change in lifestyle. We sold our home, bought a 50-foot catch, Intermezzo, and headed for the South Pacific. Our learning curve was steep, and by the time we reached New Zealand at the end of 1977, we were ready for the next step. The ideas developed through the South Pacific resulted in the 62-foot Intermezzo II. Our original nine-month cruise expanded to six and a half years in a circumnavigation. That experience was the basis for the 46 sailing yachts that followed over the next 18 years. Our personal favorite was the 78-foot water ballasted catch, Beowulf. Beowulf was what we call an apparent wind machine. She was slippery enough that she could generate power with apparent wind faster than the drag increased. In moderate trade winds, she could average 280 to 310 miles per day. It's a 20 knot breakfast. Yum, yum, yum. Yeah, I opened some of our New Zealand raspberries. Aren't they pretty? Our eight day passage from Auckland to Raivavai in the Austral Islands and 12 days, Marquesas to San Diego, are two examples for which there are YouTube videos. This is one of our favorite meals from French Polynesia pizza made with a French baguette. We would have called the pizza delivery guys, but. Beowulf's five days, three hour mark for the Caribbean 1500 is still the standard. Most fun was breaking the Guadeloupe to Antigua race record, held by the 140 foot Mary Shaw 3. It took just three hours and five minutes to cover the 42 miles. The unexpected sale of Beowulf in 2002 created a midlife crisis. Steve and I had begun to discuss the possibility of a powerboat. Howdy, this is Steve Dashen. When Linda and I realized that time was marching on and that at some point, maybe not too distant future, we would not be able to cruise with Beowulf on our own, we started to think about a powerboat. But I've hated powerboats since I was a kid, and the idea of working on one for ourselves did not sit well. But we had pushed the mom and pop sailing yacht about as far as possible, and we were at a point in our lives where a change might be necessary. We knew our sailboats motored faster, for longer distances, and much more comfortably than trawlers. So what if we removed the rig, reduced the hull form stability required for sailing, and created an unsailboat? The idea intrigued us both, except 
there was no precedent for what we were considering, other than our sailing yachts under power. This created a constant source of worry as we worked through the design. What if we'd missed something in our analysis? The primary goal of our yachts is to cross oceans quickly, comfortably, and safely. Every other aspect is subservient to this requirement. If we get this right, then we and our clients will go places. Normal motor yacht hydrodynamics are easy. You pick a speed, check a few references about the distribution of volume in the hull, and draw your lines. But this tells you nothing about steering in big, confused seas or surfing under control. With steering as the bottom line, everything changes and the standard design formula no longer apply. The fact our local sea trials have gone well means little. What matters is this first passage. We are a day out of New Zealand, headed for Fiji. It's blowing a fresh gale, just what we want to test the boat on our first ocean passage. The breeze is a steady 35 knots, gusting higher in the squalls. The seas are averaging 15 to 20 feet, with occasional bigger sets rolling by. As the front has recently passed through, these are from stern and bow quarters. We've actually been waiting in the Bay of Islands for these conditions, so we can learn how we and Windhorse handle the seas. We're going to show you some long sequences of video so you can judge for yourself. Cameras always shrink the waves, but we have a couple of photos here which may give you a better feel for size than the video. I'm wearing my seatbelt in case we get popped by a big breaking sea. Most of the interior is designed to hold us in place. In addition, there are lots of overhead handrails and countertop fiddle rails, all of which we are very happy about right now. The bridge has to work offshore in conditions like these and in close quarters on soundings. The most impressive Out of habit, so we keep watch for squalls with our radar. Our On occasion, a large one develops with heavy wind and rain. And wind horse? A touch of increased heel and then nothing. We enjoyed the challenge of working as a couple, pushing our sailboats to make fast passages. Attention to sail trim while keeping a careful eye on the weather was mandatory. Beowulf was so large and powerful that we had to shorten sail ahead of when it was needed. There was little room for error. Whereas with smaller yachts, like Sundeer and Intermezzo, we could react to the changing conditions. While I did not consider sailing stressful, the ease of being at sea with Windhorse stands in stark contrast to our sailing days. You may not have thought pushing Beowulf was stressful, but I sure did especially when I was on watch by myself. Windhorse was a revelation for me, so much easier, and I always felt in control. Given our early history with cats and the way we like to sail fast, you are forgiven if you feel we are speed freaks. Translated to crossing oceans, speed becomes a major safety factor. Beowulf came of age with the availability of grip files and PC-based weather routing. The combination of these elements, coupled with the raw speed Beowulf put at our disposal, took us into a new world in terms of making the weather work for us, as opposed to just taking what it dished out. The result was a consistent record of fast, generally comfortable passages. The minimum speed to make this work is 10 knots. Faster opens more options, and it looks like Windhorse is going to keep us in that groove. We keep talking about steering control because everything else, comfort, speed, safety, heavy weather tactics, depends on it. We fit large rudders and powerful, fast acting pilots, but most important is the hull that tends to stay on course.
which is exactly what Windhorse is doing in this confused sea stage. This is the steering tiller on one of our two rudders. Watch how little rudder action is required to hold us on course surfing these waves. The inset shows the autopilot control head. When you see the center top yellow light blink to one side, it represents three degrees of rudder angle being applied. The next day, and the breeze is back to about 150 degrees, a broad reach in sailing terms. Waves have lengthened out, and we are surfing more now. This photograph of Beowulf's bow lifting is one of my all-time favorites. There's also a lesson here. Challenge the status quo. Rather than a rare occurrence, if you put your camera on the end of the boat hook, holding it outboard often, will yield such photographs of surfing. Watching the paddle wheel speed transducer drop to zero tells the same tale. How is this possible on a displacement hull with rounded sections and a very fine entry that has been oriented towards wave piercing? There are no planing or lifting surfaces in a conventional sense. If the bow does lift, then it is going to be a lot easier to control the boat when surfing especially at higher speeds with larger waves. It took a long time and many thousands of miles of watching wind horse underway before we felt comfortable we understood what it was wind horse was trying to convey. Surfing has increased our average speed to over 12 knots and we are seeing top speeds on the waves of 18 knots. In conditions like these, we have sometimes found as little as a 100 RPM increase is enough to keep wind horse surfing continuously. Average speed is improved at little or no overall cost in fuel. Our third day at sea, and the southeast trade winds are blowing. The breeze is down, and waves are almost square to our stern, and we are still surfing. Playing with the throttles to apply momentary increases in thrust to initiate surfing also works. This is much the same as heading up a touch when sailing to build speed and then pulling off down the wave. Top surfing speed with wind horse, 25.7 knots. I can think of no more complex or challenging endeavor than designing a proper cruising yacht. You have the naval architecture, the structure, systems, storage, living spaces, ground tackle, and a myriad of other details, all which need to be integrated. This is a zero-sum game, and everything you do affects everything else. To come up with the best compromise, this needs to be done as a parametric exercise. Not just hull shape, but drive line, systems, dinghy storage, handling, ground tackle, etc. The two of us work as a team. I do tech stuff, but I'm continually bouncing ideas and questions off of Linda. Linda makes sure I always come back to the original goal and don't get stuck heading down some unhealthy channel. Trade-offs have to please her or they don't happen because I want her along with me. And for this to happen, she has to be happy. There is little in life that provides the thrill of piloting a high-performance sailplane. And a key factor in my decision to pursue the FBB project was the idea that I would spend more time flying the glider as a result. But Windhorse has proved so addictive and the destination she has made possible so alluring that my flying time has been lagging. Steve and I are starting to appreciate what it is that Windhorse has to offer. 
The concerns of the past three and a half years are in our wake, and a great weight has been lifted from our shoulders. Over the next seven years of part-time cruising, Windhorse will cover 60,000 nautical miles, with just the two of us on board. She will take us to Greenland, across the North Atlantic to the Old World, and then to Svalbard and 80 degrees north. And this with very little effort on our part. Windhorse had a lot to teach us. For example, the critical relationship between window location, radar, and where you can keep an intense lookout for hours on end. Threading our way through ice with weather coming, and fog so heavy at times we could not see the bow, changed our appreciation of metal construction, watertight bulkheads, and double bottoms, from theory to the gut. One of the goals for our FPB was to simplify the process of putting the boat into storage. We found that with a little planning, we could pull up to a travel lift in the morning and be in a cab to the airport by day's end. The cost per mile of operating Windhorse was about a third less than Beowulf. We had no problem getting clean diesel. And as a result of our range under power, typically did not require more than one fuel stop during the year. We were after a low-key military look that would be at home with the workboats and give pause to would-be pirates. In every country we visited, the local Navy wanted to know what this foreign warship was doing in their waters. So we think we were probably successful. It's been 50 years we've been chasing the perfect cruising yacht, one that is optimized for long-distance voyaging far from technical help. We never intended to be in the boat business. Like-minded voyagers sought us out. Although we had no intention of building more than Windhorse, once we thoroughly understood what made her so special and could build on what she had taught us, the inevitable occurred. 11 FPB 64s and an FPB 97 came into existence. As a result of all those miles on Windhorse and the numerous sea trials, we realized there was one more piece to the puzzle, the FPB-78. These represented a totally different approach to comfort, steering control, and performance. The three FPB-78s have in the first few years traveled more than 40,000 miles. The two FPB-70s are cousins to the 78s, and in their first seasons of cruising, went from New Zealand to Japan and New Zealand to the Aleutian Islands. We derive immense pleasure knowing that our yachts and their owners are experiencing their own first passages and then traveling thousands of miles a year pursuing distant horizons. I'd like to leave you with this thought. Although we've made our career designing and building large yachts. You can have as much fun on a 30-footer as something two or three times that large. If you've got the dream, if you've got the bug to go, do it now. It's easier to do it when you're younger rather than older. Don't wait. If you have the cruising dream, we'd like to help. Go to our website, setsail.com, where you can download for free copies of all four of our books. They cover all aspects of cruising to help you turn your dream into reality. It's our way of saying thank you to the cruising community that have helped us so often in the past.